Good morning. I love Camp Sunday for a couple of reasons. Uh, I'll go with the lighter first and go to the heavier. The lighter is this. I remember in 1982 being hired by a staff parish relations committee in Colorado Springs and saying to the staff parish chair, Colonel Charlie Vogel, how do you dress to be a pastor at the church here? He says, well, son, you can wear any kind of white shirt and tie you want every day. So I like the day at Camp Sunday where we can relax a little bit, take off the ties. And I've been thrilled to see some of you people keep T-shirts for a long time. Uh, my goodness sakes, I saw Jerry's shirt on the Dan's shirt. Some of these, some of these shirts that, that celebrate those camp-like moments in our lives. And some of you have just worn your camping clothes that you go out with. Um, and, and that's wonderful. So if you're, by the way, if you're a guest and visitor... Eh, maybe we dress this way every week, but not normally. Um, so there's that. But the second reason I love Camp Sunday is this. You'll see in a little bit later after Keith's talk, uh, uh, a video about summer games. I, I believe that summer camp is worth more than a year of Sunday school if you're able to send a student to summer camp as far as um, the li- learning they get, the, the separation from uh, their everyday lives, the things they get to do there. I, I, I've found over the years that it is simply true that more people come to relationship with Jesus Christ before their 21st birthday than in any other period in their lives. And so this church lays into this. So why I love Camp Sunday is simply truly this. We know that, we love that, and we lean into it. Keith and I are in meetings all the time about camp and other things, and hear pastors saying, I wish I could send kids to camp, we just don't have the money. And I will praise God forever and thank you for your generous hearts, because that has never been one of our arguments at Marion Methodist. We send over 100 students to camp every year, and it's never been the case that a person could not go because they had not money, because this congregation has generously filled the coffers of our Summer Games scholarship money. Every year we send about 10% of our kids that aren't able to pay anything, and we discount and help many, many others, and it's because of your generosity. So I'm not going to make a call. I'm just going to give you thanks to that. And so when the offering plates come along, if you'd like to contribute to that camp uh, ministry of, of the opportunity where, where the faith might pivot in one or many young souls, I'd invite you to simply do that. On the way to that, um, we're going to hear the climax, the apex of any Christian worship, the reading of the scripture and the proclamation of it. Pastor Keith, in just a minute or two, will be sharing uh, his testimony from John chapter 19. I'd ask that you hear these words, continuing on where we left last week. Now was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happen so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bodies will be, bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. But secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Then taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance to the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. May we pray. Father God, um, before this more moment was formed, um, you knew that Pastor Keith was about to speak to us. You have strengthened him. You have empowered him. We look forward to the words that he will say. Bless our ears in our hearing in our hearts, in their transformation. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. When you go through the the scriptures verse by verse, sometimes you come to some some texts that 
you know, maybe you wouldn't normally gravitate toward if you were just going to preach a random sermon. And uh, earlier this morning, we're gathered in for prayer here. Mike and I were talking about that. He says, you know, there, how much of a sermon can you make out of a, of a text like this? Because it just kind of talks about what happened. And it's, there's no like real teaching of Jesus. There's no words of anyone there. It's just kind of this narrative piece. But, you know, that's one of the things I enjoy about preaching through the Bible verse by verse is you skip nothing. And even in this text, we see, according to the Gospel writer John, the importance of, of these words because he himself says that the man who saw these things in verse 35 has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. You see, everything written in the scripture by, by God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit on his, on his on his uh, scripture writers was given to us so that we might believe. That's the purpose why all these things were written. And even here, we see some tremendous things that help us understand and help us believe in Jesus. You see, it was last week that we closed the scripture with three powerful words of Jesus on the cross. And they were these words, it is finished. These were the last words Jesus spoke on the cross, and then He died there. And what we see here today is immediately what happens after. What's next after Jesus decries, cries out, it is finished? How do we deal with those words? How do we deal with those moments right after Jesus dies? Because although Jesus cries out, it is finished, to His disciples, to those who were gathered there, there were certainly many things that weren't finished. See, remember, their understanding, their expectation of Jesus had, had nothing to do with His death on a cross. That wasn't part of their plan. Their plan was for Jesus to usher in this new kingdom for Jesus to reign on the earth forever, to him, for Him to restore Israel, for Him to, to be their shepherd forever. They, they didn't see a, a, a part of the plan where Jesus says, it's finished. I mean, have you ever felt like something was finished, but, but really it wasn't? See, you ever see a movie where at the end of it you go, that's it? What about what happens next? What about this? What about that? You know, what, is there going to be a sequel? What, what, what's, what's that? And, and you're left there kind of with this cliffhanger, right? See, that's what these moments were like for these, for these people gathered at the foot of the cross. It's finished, but what? Really? See, I think there were some that still, up until the very end, were expecting angels to come down from heaven and pull Jesus off the cross. Some, perhaps, at the very end, were waiting for Jesus to do something and reveal His power and for Him to come down, for Him maybe to slay His enemies. Maybe there would be laser beams that would shoot out of His eyes and kill the Roman guards. I don't know. But, you, you know, some folks probably were there waiting, going, okay, just wait. Something's going to happen. Just hold on. I know it'll be in a moment. And then he cries out, it's finished. And then he dies. What do you do with that? What do you think his followers did with that? See, the scripture tells us, and actually other historical accounts verify, that when this happened, there was a darkness that covered the land. And the curtain in the temple that divided the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies was torn in two, top to bottom. There was an earthquake. All of these things accompanied the death of Jesus. And everyone was afraid. And there was darkness. But then it says... But there were these two men who came for the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Let's, let's talk about these two men here today. Joseph of Arimathea. What do we know about Joseph? Well, one thing we know about Joseph was that he was wealthy. 
One of the ways that we know he was wealthy was that he had his own tomb that was carved out of a solid piece of rock. It was a tomb that no one had ever been laid in. And furthermore, it was in Jerusalem. That's prime real estate for tombs. And Joseph had his own one. He's from Arimathea. He's not from Jerusalem. So why does he have a tomb in Jerusalem? More on that in a moment. We know that he was an honorable counselor. That's how Luke describes him. Not too many of those in Jerusalem. We also know that he did not agree with the crucifixion. It says that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was a secret disciple because the Jews had declared that anyone who had anything to do with Jesus would be cast out of the temple. So Joseph of Arimathea loved Jesus, but he kept to himself. He was secret because he was afraid. But here now, after the events of the crucifixion, he steps out of the shadows to go to Pilate for the body of Jesus. Mark's Gospel records it this way. It says, When evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and he went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, this is strange because typically bodies were only given to the family members of the person who was killed. But here comes this man, this prominent Jewish figure who had been in the shadows as a disciple, who had been afraid, who didn't want anyone to know. While Jesus was alive, he doesn't want anyone to know. But after he sees Jesus on the cross, now he has the courage and he steps forward to ask for the body of Jesus. Let's talk about Nicodemus for a moment. Remember Nicodemus? What do we know about Nicodemus? Well, we know that Nicodemus was a teacher of Israel. But not just any teacher of Israel. He was the teacher of Israel. He was a prominent teacher of Israel. He was perhaps the most prominent teacher of Israel. Because if you remember from chapter 3, when he comes to Jesus at night for fear of the Jews, and he begins to talk to Jesus, Jesus says to him, Are you kidding me, Nicodemus? You are Israel's teacher, and you don't understand these things? About the kingdom of, of, of heaven and about being born again. So he's a prominent man, Nicodemus. We also know that he knew Jesus was from God. Because if you remember in chapter 3, he came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, we know that you must have come from God. Because no one could do the things that you do unless it's come from God. So he has insight into the divinity of Jesus. No question about that. And we also saw earlier in John, I believe it was chapter 7, where Nicodemus defends Jesus when the Pharisees gather together and plot out his death. It's Nicodemus who says, this is not lawful for us to do. He defends Jesus. And yet now, after Jesus has cried out, it is finished and dies, Nicodemus comes forward out of the shadows with 75 pounds of spices. 75 pounds of spices to embalm the body. Let me tell you something. That was not cheap. 75 pounds of spices is the amount of spices that you would use on a king. And here he comes, out of the shadows, to treasure the body of Jesus and to give him a king's burial, even though he was dead. Now, here's what you have to understand about what would happen to these two guys. We'll call them Joey and Nico, right? Step out of the shadows to go get Jesus' body. It's the day before the Passover. It's the day before the Sabbath. 
the preparation, all of these things. And, and Joey and Nico know that if they touch the body of Jesus, they will immediately be declared unclean for a period of seven days. They won't be able to celebrate the Passover. They won't be able to worship with their community because they will have touched a dead body. And a Jew cannot do that. There's nothing more unclean than a dead body, you see. But they didn't care. See, they treasured the body of Jesus. Why did these men care about Jesus even after he died? Why did they still care about him after he died? That's a powerful question that we have to answer. Because everything they thought about Jesus and expected him to do was over. Because it is finished, you see. I mean, didn't these men doubt Jesus' claims? Didn't Jesus' death mean that he was a failure? What did Jesus' death mean to these men? This is powerful stuff. I've been really reacting to it spiritually all week, trying to understand why they didn't run. Why they didn't just say, well, that's too bad, and go on with their lives. What was it about the death of Jesus that, that caused these men to have such a desire to treasure His body? They didn't likely understand that the resurrection would occur. They didn't go, oh, I'll just hang on until the next chapter of John's Gospel. Things are going to get awesome in a moment. They didn't know what the future held for them or for Jesus And they still treasured Him, get this, even when there was nothing that Jesus could do for them any longer. They give Him a king's burial. And then covered in His blood, they leave Him in the tomb. And they walk away. These men came out of the shadows as disciples and lovers of Jesus, even after it was finished, even after He was dead. Now, there are several different accounts in Christian tradition and in history about what happens to to Joey and Nico after all these events. They disappear from the Scriptures, pretty much, and and we don't really know what happens, but Scripture or tradition will tell us that, that they both became powerful leaders in the church. And that... Their wealth vanished and their standing in the Jewish community vanished as they came out of the shadows for Jesus. Some say they were martyred. But whatever happened, here's what we know. These men had much to lose for what they did for the body of Jesus. And they did it anyway. It's caused me to think about us and me. You know, are, are we following Jesus in the shadows? Have we followed Jesus in secret because we're too afraid of what others might think? And this question really struck me this week, above all weeks, given the events of things that have happened in the church and, and with people's lives and my own life. How do we relate to Jesus when He's dead? What do we do? A quick story. I just thought about this. A few years ago, I was in a church and we had a Saturday night service. And, you know, during the Holy Week, you plan everything out. And the first, the first Holy Week that we had Saturday night service, we had to ask ourselves the question, well, what are we going to do on Saturday night? You know, you have a good Friday service and you, you, we talked about the resurrection or the, the crucifixion of Jesus. We, we paid homage to that. And of course, Sunday, we would have an Easter sunrise service and Easter services to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But what do you do on the Saturday night service? You don't want to have, normally it's the same as the Sunday service, just the night earlier, but you can't have Easter Sunday on Saturday night. That wouldn't be right. So what do you do? Well, we decided to have a funeral for Jesus. And it was powerful. And we had a a casket brought in. And we set up the church the way that we would set it up for a funeral. And we had pallbearers. And we brought this casket down to the front. 
And we had people give eulogies and testimonies. And we lived in that moment and we wrestled with the question, what do you do when Jesus appears dead? Now, it's really hard for us to do that, isn't it? Because we know what happened. We know that Sunday was coming. We know that he was going to walk out of the grave, right? We know that intellectually. We know that from a historical perspective. But how do we deal with that emotionally in our lives today when the things that we seemingly ask God for or need God to do don't happen, when, when the stuff that we expected Jesus or wanted Jesus to do in our lives doesn't seem to be happening, when it seems that Jesus has said about our situation or about our need, it is finished, and we're still standing there going, no, it isn't. It, it may be finished for you, but it's not finished for me. Then, then what do you do? See, we have to wrestle with that. And we have to look at Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea for our answer. For our answer. Because here's what they did. They put treasuring Jesus above the rules of other people. Their religious rules. And you say, well, we don't have to deal with that. You know what? We still follow rules, don't we, in our society We still follow rules, don't we? How does this play out in your life? What rules control your life that cause you at some points in time to to put Jesus aside? You know, I think about the American dream sometimes. What it means to, to live in this culture. How the rules of our society and culture sometimes take us away from Jesus. I talk to people all the time who tell me why they can't do whatever God wants them to do because of some man-made rule. Okay? And it might seem silly, but it's there. Well, I'm sorry, Pastor Keith. I, I can't do this or I can't do that because this other thing's happening on Sunday morning. And I got to go do that instead. Or I can't be at this or I can't give that or I can't serve this or I can't pray because I got to go do this or this other thing's happening or that other. And I always say, well, what are those things? Well, the person said, I have to, or the this person, that, or the, the expectation was this. We put those rules above God. See, if you want to follow the American dream, if you want to have it all, then you've got to play by the rules of this culture and this society. You can't do that if you really want to treasure the life of Jesus. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea also put treasuring Jesus above their own safety, didn't they? Because they could be in big trouble for doing what they did. I mean, imagine the, the reaction of Pilate and, 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 and the, the, the Jewish high priest who just had Jesus crucified. Now, here were these two traitors coming to take his body and treasure it. That shouldn't play out. I would be in fear of my life if I were Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. But I'd be next on that cross. I'd have played it safe, right? I think many people would choose to play it safe. Do you play it safe when it comes to your discipleship? These guys have made a lot of risks. What risks will you take? What risks do you take? I've had people ask me this last year, Pastor Keith, are you sure you want to send your, your daughter to Haiti for the summer? I mean, that's a risk, isn't it? They have that crazy virus down there, maybe. Or there's bad people there. Or there's, that's, a, that's a long way to go for a long amount of time. I mean, aren't you afraid of what could happen? You know what? Yeah. I am afraid of what could happen. I'm afraid of what could happen... If when my daughter comes to me and my wife and says, I feel like this is what God's called me to do. I want to give up my summer and go to Haiti and serve these people and serve the Lord. I'm afraid of what could happen if I looked at her and said, I'm sorry, honey. Your mother and I are too afraid. We think the risk is too great. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of what could happen if, if when God has called us to step into something... 
if we wimp out. That's a risk I am not willing to take. I'm afraid of what could happen when a kid comes to to us and says, hey, I want to go to summer games, but I can't really afford it. My parents don't have any money. I'm afraid of what could happen if I was to say, well, sorry, too bad. Get a job. Earn your way. Do what I had to do when I was a kid and rake leaves and mow lawns so you can go to camp. I'm afraid of what could happen if I put a stumbling block in front of somebody. You see, there's lots of things to be afraid of. There's lots of risks that we shouldn't take. You want to know the biggest risk is missing what God has for you. That's a risk you shouldn't be willing to take. That's a risk that you should say, that's too much. Whatever the cost of following Jesus, I am not willing to risk missing out on obedience and what obedience to Christ can bring. I'm not willing to miss out on that. That's too much of a risk. But you see, we get it backwards oftentimes, don't we? And we look at the cost that we have to pay here on this earth, and we go, well, I don't know, it could be scary, it could cost me something, I could get hurt, it could be dangerous. What risk are we, are we, are we hiding behind? And you know, these guys put treasuring Jesus above their ambition, too. I mean, this meant the death knell for their careers. You think that the teacher of Israel can just go to class on Monday morning after having done what he did with the body of Jesus and go, okay, well, today we're going to talk about Jewish law. They're going to say, you can't even come in here. You're unclean. Joseph of Arimathea, this this well-known counselor was going to be put out for this. He had saved up all his money and created this tomb for himself so that he could be in Jerusalem when the kingdom of God appears. And now that was over. You see, you've got to ask yourself, what's your ultimate goal? Is it the plans of this life or is it treasuring Jesus? Does Jesus take a back seat to your plans? You've got to ask yourself these questions. Now, I've been thinking about this a lot this week. And here's what is really slaying my spirit and convicting my heart right now, personally. Remembering that these guys didn't know anything about the resurrection. Remembering that the last words they heard were, it is finished. Here's the question that's hitting me. If they did what they did for a dead Jesus, then what will you do for a risen Jesus? Think about that. I know he's walked out of that grave. I look at that now and go, oh yeah, Joseph, don't even sweat it, dude. You'll be able to go in that tomb when you're dead. Because it'll be empty. I I look at that now and I go, don't sweat it, you guys. He's going to show up on the scene in glory, resurrected, full of life. Can you imagine their faces? I know that. They didn't. If they were willing to do all that for dead Jesus... What are you and I going to do for a risen Jesus? So they had no expectations of Jesus improving their life. They weren't doing this going, all right, well, he's going to take care of me later. He's going to hook me up. He's going to bless me. No, he was dead. See, that's how you know their devotion to him was so powerful. See, my goal is to increase my devotion by decreasing my expectation. As weird as that sounds. Let me explain that to you because that might sound kind of strange. So we all have expectations of what we want Jesus to do for us in our lives, don't we? We all have those things that we kind of hold on to and say, Jesus, I need this from you. Jesus, will you fix this situation? Jesus, will you bless me here? Will you take care of that? You know, last week I'm up in, at Rochester, Minnesota in a hotel room watching cable TV, waiting to go to the Mayo Clinic with my parents. And I flip on the infomercials because I don't have cable at home, so I, I get to miss out on that stuff. And I flip it on at 3 o'clock in the morning, and there's this televangelist on there. Peter Popoff, remember him? The guy from the 80s with the headset who, whose wife was in another room uh, transmitting radio frequencies to him so he could appear to be a prophet at his crusades. Remember that guy? He, if you ever saw that, that movie Leap of Faith with Steve Martin, it was based on that. Where, where, where he would come into a, a, a group like this and he'd be like, hold on, hold on, hold on. You know, Tom Richmond in the back, stand up. 
you live at whatever, whatever address and this and that, and you've got a problem with your hip, and God's going to heal you right now. Bam! And everybody's like, how did he know that? Well, his wife's transmitting the data from the cards that the guy filled out in before. She's like, okay, the guy in the back shirt, here's where he lives. Well, he was busted. He was caught. He was a fraud. But he's back. And he's got this stuff, this miracle spring water. I'm not making this up. This is true. I saw this. This miracle spring water. And for five easy payments of forty nine ninety five, you can sow a seed of faith. And we'll send you this miracle spring water. And you just take that and dump it on someone's head. And not only will they be healed miraculously, but, you know, great things will happen in your life. And then they have the little testimonies of people. I, I bought the miracle spring water. The next day, a check for $5,000 just showed up in my, my mailbox. It's a miracle. You too can be blessed. God can fix everything in your life. He'll heal everyone you're praying for. He'll do all the stuff that you can't do. All these things will be fixed if only you do this for Jesus, right? And Peter Popoff. So we put these expectations. All right, God, I'll step out. But you better do this. Now, we don't... I I hope nobody in here has bought that Miracle Spring water, okay? But let's just step back. Do any of us act like that, right? Any of us do stuff for God, and then sort of in the back of our minds, we go, okay, I'm doing this for you, God, now you better do this for me. I'm going to give this, but you better hook me up over here. I'll serve over here, but this better happen. See, we have these expectations, and here's what I'm trying to do in my life. Maybe you can help me with this. I'm trying to decrease my expectations about what God does for me here, you see, because what I need to understand and what you need to understand is this. That our expectations for what Jesus should do in our lives here today, right now, are infinitely surpassed by what he's already done for us on the cross. Does that make sense? Anything that I could ask Jesus to do to fix my life here today, that pales in comparison to what he already did on the cross. See, we've already been given this inheritance. We've already been given eternal life. We've already been given the Holy Spirit. We've already been given everything. The glory of God has been given to us in Jesus Christ. Yet we're so willing to say, well, that's not enough. Jesus says it's finished. And I say, oh, wait, 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 you forgot something. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. May we be inspired by these two men who did what they did for a dead Jesus to infinitely treasure the body of Christ who is risen. He's risen. And because He is risen, He's there for you. See, that's finished. But this isn't. And the Scripture tells us that He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. See, the work on the cross is finished, but the work in my heart is not. And neither is the work in your heart. So may God continue to work in us and through us that our devotion to Jesus might continue to grow. We've talked about camp. We've talked about these things. We've got an amazing video presentation we want to show you before we receive our offering. invite you to give generously so that young people will have the opportunity if you'd like to do that, just write on your, on your donation, summer games or camp or whatever. We'll make sure it gets to the right place. And understand this, the risk of not, of not letting these young people hear about Jesus is far greater than the risk of whatever we lose by not stepping forward. So let's pray and the ushers can come forward. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the ministry of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. May their love for you Inspire us all the more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Summer Games University is a week-long camp experience for people between um, sixth grade and graduating high school. We make space for God to come alive and see who He is and experience him more and more. It's impossible to leave summer games the same way as you came. It's all about Jesus and our experience there is all about worshiping him and learning more about him but in the process we're changed. 
There are a lot of forms of worship, but I think one of the most powerful is through music. And so the Summer Games Band is awesome. Every year they blow it out of the water. Their music is incredible. Not only are they great musicians, but they're great leaders as, as people too. Um, and I think that these students, when they come and see these people playing music and glorifying God with their talents, they realize that they can do that too. We have to learn how to worship in everything we do. And that's why I love the sports and the satellites because we pray before and after those sports allowed and that's something that you can do even when you're at work or at school. Um, and I was there as both a camper and a huddle leader. It was really humbling because I, you know, it's my job as a huddle leader to love them, but after I'd pray for them, sometimes they'd say, well, Erica, how can I pray for you? And that just, I think that was really impactful for me. You see people walk away free, and you see, you can see the burdens lifted off of them, the way, the way they come versus the way they leave. They walk a little freer, and they worship with more passion. Worshiping and loving God and not caring what anyone thinks and not worrying about how they sound or how they look, but just surrendering completely just changed the way I worship. We experience God's love in such a tangible way, but it doesn't stay in one place. It's contagious. Summer Games really wants to make that story a reality for us to to realize that this is not just a story, that it really happened, and how we can experience Jesus' love through that story. And so every year they read the story and do a reenactment of it. And that's always a really powerful experience because a lot of people never realize that this is a real, real thing that Jesus did for us. It's not just something we read in our age-old Bible. It's it's a real story of Jesus' love. And so seeing it in person is life-changing.